Good morning. We are so glad that you are here today. Before we jump into the scripture, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 35 today. Luke chapter 12, verses 35. We continue the verse by verse uh, preaching through the book of Luke. And uh, very, uh, very excited about what God has in store for us today. But let me tell you, um, next week, I'm excited. Okay, next week is our, our family day. Uh, it's going to be a fun day. It's going to be an exciting day. Uh, we are going to have uh, both services combined, everyone together. We uh, brought in the extra chairs today. Um, and so next week, it's going to be just a, a full packed house. It's going to be a great time. Um, Father's Day usually gets in the church, usually kind of gets the, eh, you know, Mother's Day, we do brunch, we do flowers and do hoopla and everything. And Father's Day, it's like, yeah, yeah, hey, Dad, you know, that kind of thing. We're going to go all out next week is family day. We're going to have, uh, uh, we're going to have a baby dedication next week. Uh, we're going to be introducing uh, our new children's director, talking about uh, the future of our family ministries. And then after the service, we're going to have a lunch. We're going to have um, like these big blow-up stuff and cornhole and just a big party. Uh, and oh, by the way, the most important thing, we're having baptism after service next uh, next Sunday. Uh, someone asked me yesterday, how are we doing baptism? You know, um, we, there's no baptistry here. Uh, if you grew up Baptist, you'll notice there's nothing behind me. Uh, there's not a hidden wall. You know, there's nothing up there. Uh, this was a Methodist church and they sprinkled back in the day. And so, um, but we have, we purchased a, a, a really cool inflatable hot tub. And so we're going to baptize in that. And then afterwards, if y'all just want to chill in the hot tub, go for it. Um, it's going to be great. Um, I, it has taken all of my self-control not to go ahead and take that home and just test it out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's going to be a fun day next week. This is a perfect opportunity, one of those invest and invite opportunities for you to bring uh, your, uh, your friends, neighbors, or whatever. It's just going to be a fun uh, celebration type day. All the kids are going to be in here with us. It's going to be fun. All right. Got that. So I was bored a couple weeks ago, and I was, I was out of TV shows. I've already, you know, I was done. I finished the show I was watching. I didn't really, didn't necessarily want to start a new drama or anything like that. And so I was like, I just wanted to watch some TV. Football season hasn't started yet. And so I'm like, well, all right. And so I came across um, this TV show called Wicked Tuna. You, you guys ever see Wicked Tuna? It's basically a TV show where they catch fish. You know, I mean, it's pretty much it. Um, but... Um, and, and I watched a few seasons, and that's the bad part about Netflix. You, you can't just watch a show. You end up binging an entire season because they are brilliant. Because as one show finishes and you're about to turn it off, the next one pops up. And you're like, ah! You know, and so you end up watching 10 episodes. But anyway, um, I, I, as I began to watch it, I, I was thinking it fits today's message perfectly. And I, I'm not a big fisherman. I, I, you know, I fish like bass fishing and stuff like that. But as far as deep sea fishing, I'm not... I'm not, a, you know, uh, not big into that. But if you're going to be a good fisherman, you need to put yourself in the right place, and then you need to wait. And then you need to wait. And then you need to wait some more. But the important thing is not just waiting, but you need to be waiting and always being ready. Because when the fish hits, one thing I learned about when I was watching this TV show, when the fish hits and that rod goes down, there seems to be like a dozen different ways to lose that fish. And there's only one or two ways to actually get it into the boat. And so when that rod goes down, when you catch the, when, 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 when you're ready to catch that fish, when you're waiting and, you're, and that fish hits, you've got to be ready. And that's, that's very similar to what we're going to be looking at today. Today we're going to be looking at what, about being told to wait, but also told to watch. We're in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 35 through 48. I know it's a lot. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from their wedding feast. So that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds him awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house has known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, 
Are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so, find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him in an hour he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, there will be demanded more. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray, God, that we would be obedient to the context, to the teaching of your word. Holy Spirit of God, change us from the inside. Open the eyes of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to examine the scriptures a whole lot here. And let me tell you, um, th this is the hard part about preaching verse by verse. Th this is the difficult part when you want to go verse by verse. There are pastor buddies of mine that said, you know what? Don't, going verse by verse through scripture as a preaching uh, tool is, is a lazy way of doing it. And I'm like, you're out of your mind because I promise you when pastors come to this passage there are not a lot of pastors who choose to preach this this is not one of those Sundays that you're gonna walk out going woo that was happy happy joy joy time no I mean it's just not there you know but it's the truth of God and we must be faithful to teach God's truth so let's unpack it let's examine it real quick in verse 35 it says that we're supposed to stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning that is kind of the the theme of this passage to watch out then in fact title of this little mini-series in Luke is Watch Out. We started this, uh, uh, you know, uh, several verses ago. We're supposed to watch out for fear of who we're supposed to be afraid of. We're supposed to watch out for, uh, for greed. We're supposed to watch out for anxiety. And now we're watching out for Jesus. Jesus is imploring us to be, be on watch for his coming. And so he says, Lord, uh, no, I mean, he says to, to, to um, stay dressed for action and to keep your lamps uh, uh, burning. Staying dressed for action. That, ver that, that phrase there literally means, in the original language, to gird up your loins. Okay? To gird up your loins. Now, that doesn't make sense to us. That doesn't really fit our context in today's life. But let me tell you a little bit about what, what Jesus was referring to, what, what you would have seen in their day. See, back in the day, men wore those long robe things. Okay? And, and I'm sure it was really comfortable. I mean, you know, it's like nice, especially when it's hot. You know, it might have been really cool. Uh, but, but when you're wearing those long, long robe things, it might be nice when you're just casually hanging out and, you know, talking and going about the, 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 the square or whatnot. But if you had to fight, if you had to get into a, 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 a situation where you had to run or to fight or, or, or be in kind of a battle, it was kind of hindering. Moms, get, ladies, can you give me an amen if you're wearing a long dress and your toddler goes running off? Kind of difficult to get around in that thing, amen? And so, you know, men, they were wearing these long tunic things, and what they would do when they were prepared for themselves for battle is they would take the sides up, and they would kind of tuck them in their belt, and it was girding up their loins, kind of girding it up, preparing themselves, getting ready for action. And so that was the image that Jesus was giving them. You know, this idea that they were getting themselves ready for action. They're, they're, they're not being lazy. They're not being casual. They are prepared for action. They're ready to go. They're ready to, um, to, to, to do their thing. Verses 36 through 40, uh, it, it's basically two versions of the same story. Basically, what Jesus is saying, he's giving them the story that, okay, what's going to happen is you got this master. He went to a wedding. He comes back to the wedding. And when he finds the servants that have stayed up, and he found that the servants were ready, and as soon as he knocked the door, they're ready to receive him, they're ready to take care of him, that they would be blessed. 
Jesus said, in fact, that would be, that the master would be so blessed that he would take on the robe of the servant, have the servant sit, and he would bless them. He would serve them. And now this did not happen. This was not an, th- that the people who were hearing this would have found this kind of absurd. And the absurdity was the point that, that this is how blessed, how, how good this master was. And then Jesus also used the, 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 the next story saying also, you know, if the master is not aware, if the master is not there and watching when the thief comes, then um, what does he say exactly? He says, uh, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. And so we need to be watching not only for the master, but for the thief. It's two versions of a similar story driving home the point. Jesus is trying to drive home the point that we need to be watching for him. Again, last week, Jesus continuing to give us pictures of not being anxious, but to know that God cares. And now he's continuing to say, listen, not only does he care, but you guys, you need to be watching because I'm coming again. And we'll unpack that, uh, that in a little bit. Now, when we read stories like this, I used to have a hard time with this back in the day. Because I would read this. Now, we... In our culture, we live in the South. Not only do we live in the South, we live in Charleston, okay? And so when we read things like masters and servants, it brings with it a certain negative connotation because, that, because, of, the, uh, because of the stain and, the, and the, 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 the horror that was Southern slavery back in the day. And so when we read stories like this, it automatically brings this, this horrible kind of icky feeling when you think about slaves and masters and servants and that kind of thing. But it's just recently that this kind of, I got a new perspective of what this may have looked like. And I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you this because you guys are in here. I'm going to go ahead and hand you my my man card and let you know that I'm sorry and I repent. Any of you ever see this TV show called Downton Abbey? Okay, all right. None of y'all watch any of the same shows I watch. All right. So anyway, there's this, um, it's a British TV show, and um, it's set in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's, you know, these hoity-toity British people living in this castle, and they have these servants. Now, let me, just to explain myself real quick, I just want to, you know, uh, explain myself so that you don't, I don't have to give up all of my man cards. This is how it happened. Audra was watching this TV show. And she would turn it on, and I would kind of have my laptop, and I'd be doing this thing, and just be kind of slightly annoyed that she had this little thing on. And I'm like, you know, and I'd I'd be doing my thing. And then, like, you know, like the next week, I'd be like, you know, because it's there, and I'd hear, I was like, kind of a snooty guy, isn't he? You know, and I'm just kind of passively paying attention to it. And then, like, a week later, I'd be like, wow, he got himself into a thing there. That's amazing. And then now it's gotten, you know, it's gotten to where I'm like, hey, Audra, you want to watch that one? You know, so it, it's kind of progressed that way. But anyway, uh, so it, it's horrible, and, and um, but it's it's you know anyway. Uh, but the thing I liked about the show that it really opened my eyes is in this particular scenario, in this particular situation, the way they were back then, is I found that the servants in this particular area they enjoyed, they lived, they had pride in serving the master. You know, they, they didn't see it as, as a lowly thing. They, they, as a matter of fact, the, I, I told Audra, I said, they're kind of snooty for servants. You know, they're, they, don't they know they're servants? But they, te- they had pride that they represented this household. They represented this particular family. And, and so they lived and they were proud to honor the master. When he came home, it was a big deal. And they stood there with pr- beaming pride. And I was watching this, and I, was, I told Andre, I said, that, that's what it looks like. That's what the Bible's talking about. That, that's the image that it has, the, the image of, of a servant that says, the master is home, our, our boss is home, and he's coming, and, and we want to make sure, we want to show him that we, we did a good job, we took care of the house, and that everything is ready for you. Here it is. And, and so it's just a, just a beautiful image of that, and that's what Jesus is talking about there. In verse, uh, in verse 40, he calls himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man is, a famous, is the most um, 
the most common way he refers to himself. And, and this is a big deal when he refers to himself as the Son of Man because it's a fulfillment of prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, I saw in the night visions and beheld with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days that was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one, uh, his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, here's the thing. As Jesus is telling him this story, you know, Peter asks, you know, are you talking to us or other people? Because I, I think that there's a time when you look at how the disciples and talk to Jesus, and you're like, what, what are you thinking? You guys are knuckleheads. But in this scenario, he kind of gets a pass because you have to understand, at this point, they have no idea that Jesus is not only going to die, but to rise again and then promise that he will come back this point they, they don't know that part of the story and Jesus is kind of giving a picture Jesus is kind of foreshadowing that and promising that he will come again and they're like they're not connecting that piece yet that one day he will come and we'll get we'll get to a little bit later where you'll see when Peter did put it together in verse 41 Peter's question is a good one are, are you talking to are you talking to me or just us or are you talking to everybody well when you're telling this story Jesus who are you talking to? And, and, you know, Jesus responds, and he doesn't say, I'm talking to you. No, Jesus does what he does, and he responds with a story. And I, I was thinking about this, I was told the first service this, I'm like, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I think there might have been times like, Jesus, really? Another story? Can you just say yes? Can you just say no? I mean, have you ever felt like that in your life where you go to God and you go and you're like, listen, God, I need an answer. And instead of getting a direct answer, it just seems like something else happens happens in your life. And you're like, I just wanted a yes or no. I didn't need this next situation in my life to confirm or deny what's going on. Jesus, just let me know. Give me a voice. Write something in the sky. Do something. But Jesus doesn't work like that. He goes on to tell Peter some more stories. And he goes on to tell them about, you know, basically... The, 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 the breakdown for this is the master leaves a servant in charge. And the servant, after a while, he, he's in charge of all the other servants, and he, he's in charge of taking care of them, of giving them the proper food, the proper clothing, the proper drink. But after a while, the master is, uh, uh, is delayed in coming home, and so the head servant decides to, get, to, to, to take ownership of the master's home. And he begins to beat the women. He begins to beat the men. He begins to, to hoard the, the, the food and the drink and to get drunk and to, to take advantage of his position. Now Jesus comes, uh, not Jesus, the master comes back at a time that he didn't know, in an hour that was not known. And he comes back and it says that he is, that he is, um, let me put this, because actually the, this passage says that he does not know and will cut him into pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Actually, the English Standard Version softens this language. The literal language means that he is cut in two and thrown out with the unfaithful. That's hard. That's hard. <laughs> That's hard preaching. That is not the warm, fuzzy Jesus we know and love. That's hard preaching. And, and, and even the other guy who, 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 didn't, who wasn't bad but didn't do what was right, who knew what he should do but didn't do it, he was severely beaten. And even the one who didn't know what they were supposed to do and didn't do anything was slightly beaten. This is hard preaching. This is hard. Man, this is why Peter's like, are you talking to me? And here's the response. Yes. Yes, I'm talking to you. 
Yes, I'm talking to you disciples. And yes, I'm talking to the crowd. There is, the, there is this escalating um, sense of responsibility. For the church leaders, we have a deeper sense of responsibility. For the church leaders, we have a deep, deeper consequence by what we do and how we are, uh, how we're treated by how we, uh, by what we do with God's, um, God's provision. We are responsible for the proper teaching, for the loving and the treatment of his people while we are away. As I was writing this sermon, I, I just write, wrote the question now, how are we doing? I'm responsible for his people while he is away until he returns. We're to watch, we're to wait, but during the time he is saying, okay, you, I'm giving you, uh, you know, to, to charge of taking care of these people, of taking care of feeding these people, feeding them God's word, feeding them, taking care of them you know, overseeing them, shepherding them. How are we doing? How are you doing in your home? How is your, how are you doing in your home taking care of your flock? How are we doing as a church taking care of his people? Are we, are we, are we feeding the people? Are we taking care of the people? Or are we spiritually abusing people and taking advantage of his resources? You see, every person, every pastor, every church has to examine themselves and say, am I doing what he's called us to do? Or am I like that wicked servant that beats his co-workers? Notice the difference in the punishment. Especially notice that the punishment is not just for those who do wrong, but for those who don't do right. There are some people, I believe that maybe you have surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you're just, and what you're doing is you're just trying to stay under the radar. You, you have no desire to, to, to do anything good. You have no desire to contribute to anything. You just don't want to go to hell. And so you're, you're, you're not doing anything wrong, but you're not doing anything right. The point is, we're... We must be prepared because we're responsible for what we do and we're responsible for what we know. So that's examining the word. That's, that's, that's what the word means. That's, that's kind of what Jesus was getting across. So let's unpack it and what, why in the world? What does this apply? What, what does this have to do with us? What do we do with this information? Well, there's two things we're going to look at. Number one, what are we waiting for? Jesus says to wait. He says to what, wait and to watch. What are we waiting for? Well, this is the... This is a theology, this is a, 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 um, a, a doctrine known as eschatology. Eschatology is end times, that will, you know, how the world will end, the judgment, the coming judgment of God through Jesus Christ. The study of the end times, we are waiting for Jesus' return. Well, I want to give you two things. One to, thing where not to find information about eschatology and two, where to find information about eschatology. Number one, where not to find information about uh, uh, eschatology from fiction novels, okay? If you're getting all of your information about end times from fiction novels, please stop. You know, if you're, if you're reading these fiction novels about end times and it's just for, you know, just for, uh, for fun because, you know, you're enjoying it because it's, it's, it's entertainment, that's great. Understands this fiction. I tell you, where I get frustrated is when people will quote the Left Behind books to me as scripture. Well, it says in the Left Behind book, I don't care what the Left Behind book says. I don't care. And don't, don't, get, don't get your information about the end times from movies with Kirk Cameron. Can we all just say, please, Kirk Cameron, stop. You know, we don't need that anymore. I mean, you know, to those of you who 30, 40 somethings that had crushes on them and had them pinned up in your wall, can we just stop claiming him as the a, as a spiritual leader of our country? I mean, come on. You know, that, that's not where we get our information. We should not get our end times information from cheesy movies or, 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 or fictional books. We should not get our, our information about the end times from Facebook memes 
Well, I saw this link on Facebook, and it said that the, the, the actuality, the, uh, the, the mark of the beast is in this COVID vaccine. No, stop! Stop, stop, stop! No! I mean, if you're getting your information on Facebook, automatically it's probably wrong. And if, it, if you don't mark it up, if you don't quote it with Scripture, then it's absolutely wrong. If you, if you send me a link of a website and it's got some cheesy picture of the devil in flames all over it, I'm not going to read it. Come on. That's not the point. We need to stop getting... We, because the, what happens is we're, we're reading these things, we're looking at these things, and we're looking for the boogeyman everywhere we, learn, everywhere we turn. We're looking for the devil everywhere we turn. We're looking for the signs of the end times everywhere we turn. And we're getting it wrong. This is the only place we should get our information from, and that's God's Word. John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's room are many rooms, house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. Say, come again. And will take you to myself. And where I am going, may be, you may be also. And you know the way I'm going. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is where we get our information about eschatology. It's not from cheesy movies, and it will be profound. It will be amazing. It will be very, very dramatic. Jesus came the first time in a very humble way, in, 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 as a baby in a manger. But when he comes again, it will be dramatic. There will be a trumpet heard round the world, and he will come to judge the quick and the dead, and the dead in Christ will rise, and we will all meet with him. Why? Jesus will return to redeem his church and to judge and to condemn evil once and for all. All the evil that we see, all the evil that we embrace, one day will be judged once and for all by God. Where every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All the fallenness, all the brokenness of this world will be judged. And those who are redeemed and chosen by God will be brought to fullness in him in glory and that is what we should be looking for the culmination it's a beautiful thing it's a good thing the culmination of our relationship with Jesus not looking for the devil around every turn not looking for the sign of the beast with every piece of new technology we are looking for Jesus we are looking for the culmination, the, the restoration, the rede final redemption of this story with Jesus where he has finally come. He began this journey uh, in Bethlehem and it, the, the climax was, was on that hill on Golgotha on the cross and now it is completed when he comes back to judge us and to redeem us and to bring us together with him once again. That is something that we should not be dreading. It's not something we should be uh, hurting. It should be something we're longing for, that one day I will be face to face with Jesus. One day he will call our names. One day the church will be once again reunited, united with God in all of its splendor. That is what we're waiting for. That's what we're watching for. That's what Jesus is talking about. He says one day there will be a trumpet sound. One day there will be a time where we're all drawn, called together. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for Jesus. And any version of that eschatology that does not include a reu reuniting with Jesus, that does not include joy, that does not include a, a sense of completion and fullness of being with Jesus, it is, it is, is a, a perverted version of eschatology. So, all right, that's what it means to get ready. How? All right, because Jesus said we're to get ready. Jesus said to watch and to be ready. Now, remember, it was Peter who stood up and said, okay, Jesus, who are you talking to? 
Are you talking to me or are you talking to us? Because Peter was still trying to figure this out. Didn't all kind of make sense to him then. But now Luke was the last book, the, the last gospel written. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The others were, were written earlier. Luke is the last book, uh, the last gospel written. It was written 50 years after Jesus. And so Luke is able to kind of, you know, uh, to, to, see, to see back. We have the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter for a little bit because now Jesus has been resurrected. The church is established. Peter is now the head of the church and he's getting this going. He's going out and he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching to people. People are coming to Christ. But now Peter, Peter is the pastor. Now people are coming to Peter and he's got to explain these things, not only what is to happen, but how do we do it? And I find it very, very interesting. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now again, it was Peter that was there when Jesus spoke. Peter, Peter obviously remembered what was going on. This, uh, verse 13, therefore preparing your minds for action. That passage, that little section there. Again, same phrase, girding your loins for action. See, he even used, he, he remembered that, that, he remembered what Jesus said about girding your loins, preparing yourself for action, and he pulled that phrase back from Jesus. But being a pastor, he gave us how to do it. Number one, we have to watch out for sin. He says to be sober-minded. In other words, we need to take this thing seriously. We need to take sin seriously. We need to take our faith seriously. We need to take our relationship with Jesus seriously. It is not something that just happens passively. It, we should be sober-minded. It, it should not be something that should be treated with, with aloofness, but we should be sober-minded. We should be very serious in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It says not to be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You see, we always knew what was right and wrong, but we didn't know the impact of our wrongness. You thought that it was just you being you. You thought it was just you hurting you, not realizing that you were actually rebelling against a good and loving father. We have to avoid the temptations of our past because I believe that temptation, there's nothing, there, there, there's nothing uh, unbiblical about temptation. I believe that temptation is in the Bible. I think that we're always going to suffer temptation. There's always going to be the, the, the enemy. There's always going to be things trying to pull us back to our former ignorance. To, to, but when we didn't know the things of God, they're going to try to pull us back to our old ways. But we are, uh, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But there will always be temptations to pull us back to that former ignorance. We have to watch out for those former temptations that can come through three things. Number one, through people. There's some people that just make us better. There's some people that I hang around, they just make me a better Christian. They make me a stronger person. They make me a more faithful person. But there's also other people that just make me a worse person. They bring out the worst in me. Whether it's gossip, whether it's sin, whether it's shared sin, whatever it is, those people I need to cut out of my life, I need to remove from my life because they draw me to that former ignorance. Some of us need to watch out for certain places. There are certain places that we go to, maybe certain, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm from Columbus, Georgia, and when I go home, it's hard being back in Columbus in certain places because it makes me feel like that guy again that I once was. I'm no longer there, you know, or maybe it's if you struggle with alcohol, you don't want to, you need to stay away from, from places where there's alcohol. Maybe you struggle with things online and maybe you need to stay away from computers when no one's around. We need to stay away from certain people, certain places, and then certain practices. We just have to avoid it. We have to watch out for sin. We have to watch out for temptation. And then number two, we need to watch out for holiness. We need to seek out holiness. We should strive for holiness, not 
I, I heard a pastor say this one time, and, and so I'm stealing this line because it's so good. We should strive for holiness not only because God says so, but because God is so. We need to strive for holiness not simply because God says so, but because God is so. He, he is like that good father that I want to be like him. I look at God and he is holy and I want to be like God. I want to be like that father. Again, if you weren't here, go listen to that series on prayer, that series on the Lord's Prayer where we under, unpack the idea of saying our father in heaven that we have been adopted into the, the, the kingdom of God. We've been adopted by, the, by, by God our Father, that we are called his sons and daughters, and so we are his, his children. And so like that good father, I want to be like him. I, want to, I don't want to be like the old me. I don't want to be like that, that, that former ignorant one. I want to be more like a, a good son that strives to be like a good father. We strive for holiness not because God says so, but because he is so. He is a loving father, and like a child who longs to be like his daddy, we should strive to be like our daddy. The, 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 the word in the Bible is Abba, Father, Daddy. I don't want to be holy simply to check off a box. I want to be holy because my God is holy. I want to be holy because I want to be like him. Because I'm a sorry sapsucker in need of grace, and I keep messing up, and so I want to be more like my dad. In heaven. This seems like a lot of skirting with a workspace theology. You have to be good. We have to do all the right things. We have to be holy. Or, or, else, God is going to, or else God is going to cut you in half and throw you with the un... You know, that sounds so hardcore. That sounds so mean and works-based but it's not it's not works-based at all works-based theology looks at us and says you need to do better gospel theology looks at you and says you can't you've already failed we've already all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god we've all failed we 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 are born into sin the gospel theology doesn't say that you have to do better. Gospel theology says you can't, but gospel the theology says that God's already looked at us and said you failed, but I love you, and I am going to redeem you, and my desire is to bring a loving, a redeeming Savior to, so that you can strive to be more like him and hate everything that he hates. That is gospel. The gospel is that I love God and and, and I, I want to be like him, and I hate that which he hates. It's like my children. I didn't go to Georgia, University of Georgia, to school. Um, they, they didn't have a theology department. Well, they probably did, but I didn't go to it. Um, that would be scary, Georgia theology. Um, but anyway, um, so I didn't go to the University of Georgia, but I grew up a Georgia fan. Go dogs, you know? I, and so I moved to South Carolina, and so my kids... They didn't go to University of Georgia, but all their friends are either Gamecock fans or Clemson Tiger fans. And, and it's, but it's kind of, they don't, you know, they grow up not understanding. Wait a minute. All my friends are Tiger fans or, 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 or Gamecock fans. How come we're Bulldog fans? It's because daddy's a Bulldog and we are not going to say go Cox in my house. And so, um, you know, and, and so it was one of those things. And so my kids, you know, Though they weren't around Georgia, they weren't around the Bulldogs, but Daddy says, go, Daddy says two words, and my kids go, go dogs. I mean, that's just, that is gospel in my house. Not, not gospel, I'm sorry, but, you know, that's, that's just, it's, you know, around football season, that's hardcore in my house. My kids love Georgia because I love Georgia. My kids despise Auburn because I despise Auburn. I mean, you know, it's like my kids don't, they, my kids probably couldn't find Auburn on a map. They have no idea. But I can't stand Auburn, so therefore my kids can't stand Auburn. And so it, it's that to the umpteenth zillionth degree. I love holiness because my God loves holiness. I hate sin because my God hates sin. And I want to be like my father. So let's go back to Luke 12. We must be ready. 
We must live ready. I don't spend a lot of time looking for signs of the end times. There are verses that say we should be, that, that we should. I, I'm not going to be looking for the sign of the beast. I'm not going to be looking for the Antichrist. I worked in a Christian bookstore. I remember when Bill Clinton was the president, there was actually a book that said Bill Clinton, the Antichrist. And I was like, <laughs> listen, that's, that's giving him a lot of credit. I mean, I, I mean, that's just a country bumpkin from Arkansas. I think, you know, um, I don't, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for Jesus every day. Every day, I want when he comes, when that trumpet blows, and when he comes, I want him to see me. And he may go, hey, Sean, you didn't even see when, when, when there are people handing out things and that was the mark of the beast? I didn't get it, Jesus. Sorry, I missed the boat. Jesus, be, Sean, you didn't notice when there was an antichrist driving? I didn't see it, Jesus. I missed the boat. I'm, he may say that to me, but I promise you, if he, said, if he comes, he's going to say, Sean was looking, he's waiting, he's making sure that his house was, to, was, was taken care of. He's making sure that his house was prepared. He's making sure that his house was ready. So when Jesus did come, we were all ready. We're looking, we're waiting and said, Jesus, when you come, come on in because our house is ready. Our house is ready. Open the door because our house is ready. We've been waiting on you. Everything is ready. We're taking care. We've been taking care of those who are hungry. We've been taking care of those who are thirsty. We've been taking care of those who are sick and hurting. God, when you come, we have taken care of your house. We are ready. And God, just like what he said in, in, in Luke 12, he's going to take off. The, the kingly robe, he's going to put on the servant's robe. He says, come with me. Come to my house. And I'm going to serve you now. I'm giving you the choices to everything. That is what eschatology is. That's what he's telling us. He's like, pay attention to me. Watch. Don't sit idly by. Don't take advantage of what I've given you. Watch for me. So, final question, are you ready? Have you been playing church? Have you not been sober-minded when it comes to your faith? Are you ready? Secondly, are you a believer and yet there has not been a sense of urgency to your faith? You are not an abusive caretaker of your faith, but you are not doing anything good with it either. Your sin is a sin of omission, not commission. What are you going to do about it? Today I'm going to pray for you. And I just want you to ask God to reveal to your heart what it is, what steps you need to make to be ready, to be watchful, to be obedient, to be holy. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. And God, I just pray right now. I pray that we would be obedient. I pray that we would be watchful. I pray, God, that we would be uh, faithful to taking care of your house while you're away. When you return, it's my prayer that we will have a house ready. That our house will be in order. It's my prayer that everybody in this room, everybody listening online, would do everything they can to make sure that their house is ready. That they're eager, that they're waiting, that they're watching. taking care of what you bless us with. Holy Spirit, move in this place.
in your name we pray. Amen. Before we're dismissed, just want to uh, let everybody know, just remind everybody we are having baptism next week. We have three or four um, confirmed to be baptized. If you would like to follow up with Believer's Baptism, you've never done that, you've never followed him, you, you have a relationship with Jesus, you've followed him, but you've never been baptized and you would like to do that, then, then please uh, reach out to me and let me know. Um, man, it's going to be a good week next week. Can't wait to see you. Um, and uh, also, listen, we have a lot of people. Uh, if you don't get our newsletter, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, we have a lot of people on vacation this week, and so and it's going to be that way for the next four or five weeks. And I get that, and I, I applaud that. I, you know, take a break. You know, enjoy your family. Uh, and, 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 and come back just, you know, restored. Come back ready to go, ready to... Uh, ready to, 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 to do your thing. I, I just want you to hear from me that, that if you need to take a week and, and go to the mountains, go to the beach or whatever, you take a week. Enjoy yourself. Do not, don't hear that guilt. I, I, I hated when I was in church and a pastor, you know, you know, person don't take a vacation from Jesus. I ain't Jesus. I'm a preacher, you know. And, and so if you need to take a week off, now if you take three or four, I'm coming after you. I'm just telling you that right now, you know. But, you know, but so, how, you know, enjoy yourself each day. Seek the Lord. Be watching. Be waiting. I love you guys. Have a great week. Go and send them more.